New Philanthropy Capital. Lovely to have you all joining us. Thank you so much. Fantastic to see so many from all over the country joining. Such a wide range of organizations as well. That's really brilliant. We got some focusing on social issues, some on environmental issues. I'm sure many who are also looking at a wide range of different topics. Right. Numbers are still creeping up, but much more slowly now. So let us make a start. A very warm welcome to you all joining us today. So pleased to see so many here. And really wonderful to be talking about the important topic of the climate and nature crises and what this means for you as trustees. Just to introduce myself, I'm Liz Gadd. I'm one of the principal consultants at MPC and I oversee our strategy work. And in my volunteer life, I'm also a trustee of the Environmental Funders Network and of Pesticide Action Network UK. And I'm joined today by two utterly fabulous speakers who are going to be sharing a bit from their perspective on the subject. So we'll hear from each of them in turn and then have time uh, to answer your questions and have some discussion together. Before we get started, though, a wee bit of housekeeping. Uh, so this is a free public webinar open to all and there may be journalists present. We'll be recording the session, including any questions you ask, and it will then be available for others to watch, either yourself or, or others who weren't at the event afterwards. If you're going to be active on social media, tweeting or what have you, we'd encourage you to use hashtag MPC trusteeship so that others can join the conversation. And do feel free to ask questions at any point throughout the session using the Q&A function or in the chat, and um, we will be collating those to be able to use in the discussion at the end. Um, so we last thing to say, we are super grateful to the Cloth Workers Company for making it possible to put on this event and others in the series for free. They've been supporting these trusteeship seminars for many years now. Um, without their support, they, it wouldn't be possible. So thank you, cloth workers. Just before we uh, get into listening to the speakers and the meat of, of our conversations today, I have the privilege of setting the scene a little this afternoon. Um, you may have seen in the press that last month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, released the final part of their latest review on progress around addressing climate change. And the key messages in that included, we're not moving quickly enough, we have no time to waste, and that we all need to pull together to take action. And that action is possible. There are many things that we can be doing together locally and globally. Whatever level you're looking at, global or local, it's always the least privileged who are the hardest hit. And here in the UK, that's often those that charities are already working with anyway. Groups such as young people, older people, disabled people, uh, those from ethnic minority communities, people living with existing health conditions, those living in poverty. And those who are affected by multiple disadvantage are even more greatly affected. And the way all of us, particularly those most vulnerable groups, will be affected could be in two different ways. It could be directly impacted by the climate and nature crisis, or they could be impacted as well or instead by related policy changes. The key direct impacts relate to heat waves, storms, flooding, air pollution, as well as the impact of access to green space and exposure to other forms of pollution, such as toxic chemicals, untreated sewage or coastal erosion that affects some seaside communities, not to mention wider loss of biodiversity. And those who are the most affected by these direct impacts are often the least aware and certainly the least engaged in related policy decisions uh, about developments that affect their lives. So from a governance perspective, it's essential that we as trustees understand the risks to our programmes and to the people that we serve. And thinking about 
sort of this from a, a regulation perspective, I can say that at the moment, anyway, addressing the environmental crises in your work isn't a legal or regulatory requirement. However, as trustees, you are required to manage risk and make balanced decisions um, in a way that considers the long term as well as the short term. And I've asked Dan to post a few quotes and some links into the chat that you may find helpful on that topic, especially for those who are looking to make a case to fellow trustees to be thinking more about environmental issues. But above all else, um, it's likely that those you support will be amongst the groups most affected by the climate and nature crises in the UK. And so as a sector, we have a moral responsibility to explore our role. As charities, we can support communities that we work with and for in five key ways. The first one is to better understand how their lives will be affected by the climate and nature crises. For example, helping those we work with to understand risks and preparing for extreme weather events such as heat waves and floods. We're forecast to have significant heat waves this summer, and indeed many parts of the country are still officially in drought from last summer. So these are very live topical issues. The second is to better understand how lives will be affected by related government policy. So, for example, green jobs providing new employment opportunities for those able to access the right training or home insulation that can reduce bills as well as carbon emissions. The third area is helping to raise voices so that uh, their views and needs are heard by policymakers and others. And the fourth is to consider how your own programmes, your services, your strategy may need to change as a result of our changing climate and nature. So, for example, questions like, Will your, your service, your programme delivery need to change in extreme weather events? Will the people you support become more isolated if changes in transport policy aren't shaped to meet their needs? Are you working with a community that faces a particular risk? Perhaps they're more likely to be exposed to air pollution, flooding, coastal erosion or, or another specific threat. And if you're a charity that engages in advocacy, influencing, campaigning type work, how could you integrate environmental issues into that? And then fifthly and last, very deliberately last, you will no doubt be thinking about how to green your own operations. And many charities feel a massive pressure to, as they say, get their own house in order before working on any of the other issues that I've noted. So my plea to you today would be not to stall. Um, and whilst thinking about our own carbon emissions is quite important, the greatest impact that we have as a sector is in supporting the communities that we're working with. And that's where you'll make the greatest difference. There's going to be some more information published by MPC over the coming months um, that will help you to better understand how the climate and nature crisis will impact some of these groups that I've been um, mentioning. We're working at the moment with uh, over 40 charities and funders from the social and the environmental sectors on our Everyone's Environment programme. And through this programme, we're going to be publishing a series of briefings over the next couple of months on how different social groups will be affected by either the environmental crises or related policy. And the first one is due out in a few weeks, looking at how young people will be affected. And that will closely be followed by briefings on ethnic minority groups, experiences, older people and disabled people, how they will be affected. And then there'll be more to follow in the autumn on specific health conditions and those living in poverty in low income households. So we're going to be uh, collaborating with our partners in this programme over the next couple of months to talk directly with these groups about how their needs, their priorities, their lives are affected by these issues. And we're going to be sharing their views and our findings together uh, in due course uh, towards the end of the summer. So there's a, a link going into the chat. If you're interested in learning more, um, please do follow what we're doing. Sign up to our newsletters to hear about forthcoming events and publications and get in touch 
if you would like to be involved. So without further ado, on to the first of our wonderful speakers today. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you first Rushinara Ali, who is chair and co-founder of Uprising and One Million Mentors, an organization that offers leadership, mentoring and employability programs for young, diverse communities across the UK. Rushnara has previously worked as an Associate Director of the Young Foundation, where she co-founded Uprising in uh, 2008, alongside Mashara and the Social Innovation Exchange. She's currently the Labour MP for Bethnal Green and Bow, which uh, I believe we've been doing since 2010, and has served on her journey on the Labour front bench and been a member of several select committees. She's currently a member of the Treasury Select Committee. So over to you, Rashanara. If you could unmute yourself, that would be super. Old habits die hard, right? Um, well, hello, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much to NPC and partners for uh, organizing this seminar uh, and webinar. Um, I'm really pleased to join you all. Uh, and I was asked to say a bit about the sort of background to Uprising and uh, and then sort of speak more to some of the key points that, that, uh, that, that I hope you'll be interested in. Um, just to, before I get into... Um, the organization that I co-founded, I mean, you've already heard about some of the challenges facing uh, the, the world um, here at home and globally. And, and my background um, is, you know, I'm someone who was born in a country that is one of the most climate vulnerable in the world, Bangladesh. Um, I represent a constituency that has a sizable um, British Bangladeshi and Somali uh, heritage population. Uh, and these two, two places um, are kind of uh, uh, sort of ex demonstrate um, the, the types of challenges countries in the global south face, you know, in one case, drought, in another, flooding. Uh, so, you know, in my own constituency, as well as the local, the global is a big concern for young people as well as uh, others uh, who are residents directly in terms of it, how it affects their lives here at home and also in, in terms of family and friends in their countries of origin. Uh, so uh, for me, the climate crisis and climate emergency is something that's absolutely integral to what I do and what, what we do um, locally. Uh, and one of the things that's really important is making sure young people have a really important role, central role in how we uh, fight for uh, a, a, a better deal for uh, people in our own countries to support them as well as the uh, other countries. In terms of what we have been doing, uh, what we did with the um, Uprising Leadership Charity, uh, when it was set up, I mean, in a way, the date it was set up, 2008, the, the, around the time of the global financial crisis, um, it was a challenging environment to start up a new charity. Uh, and often funders tend to support things that are tried and tested. Uh, and it required a big leap of faith for funders to get behind this initiative, which was about training, recruiting and training a new generation of young people, uh, young leaders who can make a difference in their own communities by um, investing in their skills, by providing mentoring, coaching, support, uh, and helping them to develop campaigns that they are passionate about, that they feel is gonna benefit their community and their country and giving them some space and freedom to be able to come up with ideas that, uh, that then help. Some people started to develop um, campaigns about local environmental issues of their own accord. Um, others developed campaigns around supporting employability opportunities for young people. Uh, you know, others worked on uh, supporting um, work with older people and intergenerational work, a wide range of campaigns that they set up. So our focus was about empowering young people uh, through giving them access to networks, giving them training, giving them confidence so that they were the ones who were could become the agents of change. 
and in time building a movement of thousands of young adults who could then work to shape and change their communities and their country. Um, and, and over a number of years, we've worked with, uh, you know, intensively with around 5,000 people uh, who are young leaders. Um, we started working with them from the age of 18 to 25 uh, obviously 15 years ago. Uh, so some of them are sort of in their 30s now doing fantastic things. And I, I'm really proud of the fact that one of the one of the people working in your organization was involved with our, um, in NPC, with, was on our environmental leadership program. So the journey to developing an environmentally focused leadership program was actually came from the young people themselves. Because as they were going through the core leadership program we set up, we could see that one of their passions among a number of young people who are on our program was about protecting the environment. And they were coming up with fantastic campaigns uh, that they were developing as a collective. Uh, and we were very much focused on building teams. Once they got the, the skill sets and the support, individual support, then working collaboratively in groups to develop campaigns together as part of the sort of team building, team working set of skills that we wanted to instill in them. And what we then had was, um, I had a, I had a, I've been very lucky in having uh, chief executives who were very good at seeing where the energy and and the insights were coming from in terms of what young people were doing on our programs. And so, one of our early CEOs, Andrea uh, uh, Cooper, uh, uh, put together a bid to the uh, big lottery fund. Uh, to develop an environmental leadership program. And, and that was sort of nearly 10 years ago, at a time when the focus wasn't enough, frankly. I mean, there still isn't. There could be more, but more has been done since then on uh, investing in young people to be, to be uh, campaigners, to support charities and organisations that they wanted to set up or work with other organisations so that they can make a difference. Um, so she developed a program and a bid uh, that she wanted to submit uh, to do this with a network of other organizations working in the environmental space. Uh, and the other issue that we were concerned about, because our organization is about diverse talent in different communities and also targeting young adults from Black and Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds um, and others with protected characteristics, um, and uh, young, white, disadvantaged young people who were also often left behind. Uh, and what we wanted to do is make sure the environmental space and campaigning space, which we felt at the time, and I know more progress has been made, was um, tend to be uh, not very diverse. So what we then did is put together this, this uh, package uh, and we were very grateful to the Big Lottery Fund in supporting that program. Uh, and we had only just started up as a charity. We hadn't even got out of the Young Foundation where we, this organization was incubated. Um, it, it, I think we were on the cusp of becoming an independent charity. And we were seeking to do a very ambitious program over five years. Uh, and, uh, you know, I certainly, you know, uh, said to my my chief executive, you know, what do you think? Do you think we can do this? It's very ambitious. And she said, absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's going to be brilliant. Uh, and she was very good at enthusing the board and getting the board behind her. Uh, and subsequently, we we set up what we, we were successful in this bid as part of the Our Bright Future initiative, uh, which is a wonderful, wonderful name that they gave this program. And we've been able to work with hundreds of young adults. Uh, and just to give you a flavor of what the Young Environmental Leadership Program did, we worked in London, Birmingham, Manchester. Uh, uh, we had a very focused program in Liverpool, also Cardiff uh, and Bedfordshire. Uh, and there were sort of over, the, over that period, 15 environmental leadership programs with uh, over 500 uh, young people. Uh, who ran 62 social action campaigns. Uh, and, you know, th there was a really interesting mix of um, campaigns that involved those young people then engaging 
thousands of others um, through their through their work and getting them involved with the campaigning work they were doing. And so the knock-on effect and the multiplier effect of um, impacting local communities was huge. Uh, we weren't able to capture all the data, but it was really powerful in terms of the multiplier effect. The final thing I'd say about the actual program is in terms of the demographics we were able to capture and bring into our program, 75% uh, of our participants were women, young women, young young girls. 25% um, uh, were men, 48% um, uh, from ethnic minority backgrounds, uh, uh, quite a considerable diversity in terms of religious backgrounds, those who defined 6% to find themselves as having a disability, some 5% preferred not to say, so it's likely to be to be greater, 10% identified themselves as LGBTQ+, 17% um, preferred not to say again, likely to be higher. Uh, and um, so, so that gives you a flavour of um, the, uh, the work we were able to do in terms of diversity diversity. Uh, and what was really important for us in terms of reaching out was using alumni um, to help recruit, uh, using community networks, going into colleges, uh, going into community organisations to be able to recruit people, young people. Uh, and so, and the, and the final thing I'd say in relation to the programme was around the impact, as well as doing um, things to serve the community and building campaigns, which was the most powerful in terms of impact. In terms of the personal impact on the young people who are leading um, the campaigns and who are on the programmes and becoming uh, agents of change, for them, about 14% um, said that the, in terms of the, the particular indicators we were looking at, um, there was a 14% improvement in confidence, 28% increase in knowledge, 20% in development of skills, 43% um, in network in terms of feeling that they were able to broaden out their networks uh, uh, and, a, and a, about 20% um, increase in, in well-being. Uh, so those are the kind of indicators that give you an idea of what the sort of personal um, benefits were to young people, which then uh, meant that once they overcome, over, were able to overcome some of the things that they felt were barriers for themselves, um, they could then go forward and build um, a wider set of campaigns to be able to make a difference in their communities. So that's just, uh, that's in terms of what we did in terms of the program itself uh, and in how we impact, uh, how we were able to make change in communities. I think the bigger benefit as well for a program like that was being able to work with um, funders, and partner organizations to encourage them to do more with other charities and support other charities so that they could work with young people in the environmental space. Uh, and I suppose what I say is the most powerful way to do that, of course, is um, making sure young people who were on those programs were able to interact with the decision makers and the power holders. And the essence of Uprising, and, I, and it's a precocious name, but again, the young people came up with the name, which was a, a kind of being able to uh, rise up, if you like. Uh, and of course, the environmental space needs that more than anything. Uh, this was this happened, the work we started was long before the big campaigns started. Um, and uh, what's really heartening to see. Just one minute more, Rishnara. What's really heartening to see is the way that young people have really dominated this space, both in the UK and globally. Uh, and uh, we feel that there's a great deal that more we can do to empower young people and support young people in the future, so that that they can feel that they are able to make a difference. Because there's a huge there's a huge sense of powerlessness. Uh, which is what we were trying to address in terms of tackling the big challenges facing uh, the environmental um, uh, space. So um, that's the that's just to give you a flavour of through the lens of one program we ran as a as a group of uh, as a charity. The final thing I'd say is in terms of going forward, because of this track record, um, we've been very fortunate in having interest from foundations in supporting this work going forward. Uh, and I very much hope that funders who are involved and, and might be on this call 
um, look to organizations that are in this space uh, to to help enable young people to take a leadership role in in the environmental space and continue to to do that. We're very grateful for the work that we you know we've done and and the support we've had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rashanara. A very inspiring story about a very inspiring organization. Thank you. For those listening, do please keep adding your questions in the chat and the Q&A function. Um, we will come together to ask questions and have a discussion after our next and final speaker. Um, it is now my utter pleasure to introduce Karen Parry. Karen is the CEO of Inclusion North, which is working across the Northeast, Yorkshire and Humber. Uh, to increase inclusion for people with a learning disability, autistic people and their families. She also leads the uh, Take Action to Stop Climate Change group, which explores how training and information on climate change could be more accessible to autistic people and people with a learning disability. And the group is developing resources to train other organisations also on this journey. Wonderful to have you here. Over to you, Karen. Thank you so much. It's um, really good to be part of this seminar this afternoon. Um, so, yeah, my name is Karen Parry. I'm Chief Executive at Inclusion North. And I just wanted to tell you quickly how an organisation that is set up around um, disability inclusion ended up making a promise to take action to stop climate change. Next slide, please. So just a quick bit about who we are and what we do. Um, as has already been said, we exist to promote the rights and inclusion of all people with a learning disability, autistic people and their families. We're a community interest company that covers a big region in the north of England, and we've been running for 15 years. Our board of directors is made up of equal numbers of people with lived experience and people with professional experience. And when we say people with lived experience, we mean people with a learning disability, autistic people and their family carers and those numbers make up 50-50 on the board. So all our practice has to be totally inclusive. Next slide, please. So where we started our climate change journey, as with a lot of things, it started with an opportunity that we didn't really see coming. So we hadn't planned to talk about climate change, hadn't been on our agenda at all, but then we had the offer of a young person to join us as an intern. Um, in the summer of 2021 and he had himself a passion for climate change and a real link to social justice and he talked to me about climate change, modern slavery and sustainable procurement and I didn't really know what all those terms meant, knew that some of my board members would find that really difficult so we needed it simplified and we needed somebody to help us to understand why this was our business Next slide, please. So our intern devised an accessible session for us to explore the ideas. The session was open to everyone in the organisation. So that was our board of directors. We have an advisory council and then our diverse staff team. And the session was really designed to simplify the terms, just to explain what do they mean, um, to link it to people's lived experience, to make it really real and to really make sense, to try and find the connection to these things and our mission as an organisation and to make the connection to our values as an organisation. Next slide, please. So one of the ways we did this was to really bring it close to home. And this is one of our intern slides that he used with us in that session. And he explained that Romanian workers were brought to Carlisle and forced to work 11 hour days, six days a week at a car wash. And one of those men said, it made me lose all trust in humanity. And the water had eaten away at my feet after having been forced to work nine days in a row without proper protective equipment. Now, where we work is very close to Carlisle. So one, geographically, that brought it very close to home. This isn't a problem that's happening somewhere else. It's happening where we are and where we're working. And very quickly, people could remember other stories they'd heard in the news that were very similar from their area. And all of a sudden, everyone was talking because they all were aware of this. They just hadn't realised that this is what we were talking about. Next slide, please. 
So after that session where we were able to really connect the issues of climate change, modern slavery and sustainable procurement to our values and to our mission, we asked people on that um, meeting to volunteer to form a small working group. And obviously the most passionate people stepped forward um, and volunteered to be on that. So we ended up with a group of maybe 10 or 12 people and they came from all parts of the organisation. So we had de- directors that volunteered, advisory council members and staff team members. And we met once a month starting in autumn 2021 and we went into lots more um, lots more depth exploring the ideas. We asked lots of questions and what we found out was how deeply ignorant of most of the issues we were. We had more questions than answers, but it really led us on to kind of formulating a position for the organisation and developing a plan. Next slide, please. And this was our starting point. We realised we had to keep it really simple. We had to make it real and understandable. Um, So this was our kind of position statement, which is we care about people with a learning disability, autistic people and their families. We care about the places where we live. We care about our planet. And that's why we're passionate about taking action to stop climate change. And that became the beginning of our pledge as an organisation to do some work on this. Next slide, please. So we decided there were three big things that we could do. Um, We could change how we run Inclusion North to make sure what we do can help stop climate change. So we can think about our travel, where we acquire, you know, our supplies from. If we have food at a meeting, how far that travels, what kind of food is. There's all sorts of things we can do as an organisation. We also realise that we can influence other people who are more powerful to do more to stop climate change. One of our business models is that we have local authorities as members of our organisation. So we've already got influence with 18 local authorities in our region. So we could use those relationships to influence people who are more powerful than ourselves. And the third thing that we thought we could do was to make sure that people with a learning disability and autistic people are included in the campaign to stop climate change. We couldn't find any accessible information about climate change anywhere. None of the big climate change charities produced such things. There was nothing anywhere, which made us realise that people with learning disability and autistic people aren't seen as active citizens. They're not seen as potential activists and campaigners. They're entirely ignored in the whole conversation. And so because of the nature of our organisation, that's where we wanted to start. Next slide, please. So before we could start, there was something we had to do. Next slide. And that was educate ourselves to learn more about climate change so we understood what it means and how to stop it. Because we were literally having conversations about is paper better than plastic because you have to cut trees down to make paper and we know deforestation is causing massive problems, but plastic takes ages to um breakdown and we had no answer to kind of some of these really simple questions and that's where our level of understanding was so we knew we had to educate ourselves but as we've said no accessible information so how were we going to do that next slide please so we just put a plan together so we did a climate change action plan for 2022 there was only four things on it because I think the bigger a plan gets the less less likely you are to implement it and it just feels too overwhelming So we decided we would start by doing some training so we understood more about climate change and how to stop it. We would then take our learning and we'd make that accessible for all people with a learning disability and autistic people. We would do some work to look at how we run Inclusion North and make a plan to change things that are bad for the environment. And we'd make a list of who we know that have got more power than us to stop climate change. And we'd make a plan to talk to them and ask them to do more. Next slide, please. So our next steps. So we found some funding. It was a lottery um, grant called Together for Our Planet and we put in an application for that. It was one of those small pots of money that's under £10,000. So we asked the lottery to fund us 
to try and do some training and to convert that training into an accessible format. Um, we were a diverse group, so there were people with a learning disability and autistic people on, in, our, um, in our steering group in the company. So we needed to co-produce that together to create accessible training, information, and resources. And as soon as that's ready, we're going to share that freely. It will be available to download on our website. And we've also got some funding from the lottery to go and deliver that to other local groups as well. So at the same time as educating ourselves, we're also creating resources so other organisations don't find it as hard as we do when they come to be at this stage in the process. Next slide. We also went back to the board regularly. So we put a public statement on our website, which was our pledge and our plan. So we wanted to run that past the board. They had to approve that and sign that off. We also talked about our annual budget and how making climate conscious choices aren't always the cheapest things to do. So we wanted to keep a track of the extra money we were spending um, and acknowledge that in our budget. So we put a line in our budget and the board needed to agree that because they sign all our finances off. And we also needed the board to ratify our approach and plan. So there was a constant dialogue with our board, really. It really helped that they had been in the original session to understand why this is our business. And then we just kept them up to date with some of the key decisions. Next slide, please. So. There are ongoing tensions. It's not an easy, straightforward journey by any means. I think for me as the chief executive, one of the tensions is trying to make sure this remains a priority as other pressures hit. Um, we've got capacity issues with our staff team at the minute, which means that, you know, you focus on the things that we absolutely must do. And to be absolutely honest, the climate change work is one of the things that can wait in some respects. I mean, not in a global aspect, but, you know, in terms of juggling the work. So trying to keep it a priority is an ongoing pressure, absolutely. Trying to think through what's reasonable in terms of the extra we would spend on more climate conscious actions um, and it, negotiating that with the board on an ongoing basis. And also resisting ableist climate change solutions and what I mean by that is that a lot of the climate change solutions that are put out in terms of what individuals can do themselves to make a change, to make a difference to climate change, don't really take into account the needs of disabled people. So things like walk or cycle or use public transport rather than driving um, can be really difficult for some disabled people. Turning your heating down can be very difficult people with certain conditions. So it's really thinking about how can we find our own solutions to climate change that actually take into account the needs of people with a learning disability and autistic people. And that is difficult because that conversation isn't in the mainstream um, forum and talk about climate change either. So that is something that we are kind of wrangling with because there aren't any easy solutions to that. So I think from my memory, that is my final slide. I just check, yes. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Cara. That was absolutely wonderful. So inspirational. And I'm just really struck by how humbly you talked to us through this fantastic, very straightforward, pragmatic, step-by-step -step approach. It's amazing what can be achieved by just taking one next step at a time. It might seem daunting at the beginning, but I guess you'd never have imagined where you'd be on that journey at the start. And I'm sure I speak for many when I say we're all jumping up and down inside with excitement about the thought of your accessible training resources being released at some point in the not distant future. So massive thanks. We're going to go to questions from the audience now. So please do continue to pop things in the chat in the Q&A function or raise your hand in Zoom if you're happy to unmute and ask a question. Whilst um, I give you a moment to gather your thoughts about what you'd like to ask first, I'm gonna take chair's prerogative and ask about, first of all, collaboration between trustees and senior leaders was one of the 
the themes that jumped out at me from what you were both saying. So Rishanara, you spoke very eloquently about the value of strong leadership teams. And you said you were very lucky with your chief execs. I suspect you recruited very well. So, you know, not entirely luck, but wonderful relationship between the two, obviously. And then Karen, you talked about an ongoing dialogue with the board. So pulling those thoughts together, I wonder what tips for collaboration between trustees and seniors, uh, senior leaders that you might be able to share with those listening today? Uh, do, do, who do you want? Go yeah, for it, Rishnara. Well, I, I certainly found it really helpful to have, chief, where it works extremely well is if you've got a chief exec and lead, leadership team who, um, uh, who use the insights of the people they're uh, supporting, in, in our case, young adults, and bring that those insights uh, into the um, projects that they think we should be developing. And so when we started, our leadership program was a core leadership program. We didn't stipulate, we didn't say it should be on the environment or, you know, health or education so that young people had the freedom to choose the the subjects that they wanted to then campaign in. And we felt that was really important. But what was really powerful was that that actually, you know, uh, the CEO with her team came back and said, these are our observations. And so we need to go in this direction with this new initiative um, uh, alongside the one we're doing, focusing on the environment and taking a longer term view. And so in working closely and informing the board along the way and then presenting an ambitious program and and it was extremely ambitious i mean uh, the initial bid was to run the, the initial program uh, uh, aim was to run an 18 million pound fund that we were going to you know then use to deploy to uh, to 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 give to other organizations to work on and i said <laughs> that sounds like a very ambitious thing to do and what she said was look we're probably not going to get the fund to do this and, and be you know be able to do things on that scale but it means that it's an opportunity for us to build partnerships with other organizations who are also trying to to do this and it doesn't matter because it will be like getting a job interview we get a chance to tell them what we want to do as well um and what we are about and we were very new and and I said, uh, you know, and as soon as she presented it in that way, because, uh, of course, as a board, you've got to work out, well, is this too much for a new organization? Should another organization be doing this? Um, should we be a partner and they should lead? So you've got to ask all those provocative questions of your team to make sure we're not you're not biting uh, off more than you can chew. Uh, and actually, it, that iterate that iterative conversation with board members uh, and the chair in my case was really important in in getting to the right outcome and in the end the right outcome was although we weren't successful in that large bid what we were you know she was absolutely right uh what we were successful in is is explaining the vision of what what we were trying to do and that coming from young people themselves as well um so linking the those who are benefiting from a program really putting their insights just as Karen has said at the heart of what you're doing and then making sure that you work through with the expertise and experience of the management team as well as the board and and their expertise to ensure that you've got something that's workable and tangible and deliverable and that the person who's going to deliver and run the program and the team that the funders have confidence in that team is really key that that's that was our experience anyway Yeah, and I think for ourselves, I think it depends on the culture in your organisation and how it runs. We're not a top-down kind of organisation. We are, like, really collaborative. Um, but I think starting from the point of view of asking the question, why is this our business, and really connecting it to the mission for why you exist to begin with really helped. Because when we looked at the statistics that disabled people would be one of the hardest hit groups by climate change then all of a sudden no one in the organization can kind of argue against why we are focusing on this as an issue so very much kind of connecting that and then connecting it to our values um was a good place to start um i think inviting everyone along to the same meeting and putting everyone on the same level in terms of decision making and influence was really helpful you know it's just an exploratory conversation to begin with 
created from an opportunity from having an intern working with us. And people could just explore the issues and, and how it relates to our organisation. And then, you know, go into the people who are already passionate, people who are already won over and start there. And then we can gradually chip away at everybody else. Um, I think it does help. I mean, it, it does help um, where those people are positioned in the organisation. Because if your CEO and chair of board are not really on board, then the potentially are more barriers um but trying to find the kind of champions in the organization I guess and and working from that point of view um yeah is certainly where we started well thank you both we've got a a question from Ben in the chat that uh, is very close to my heart Ben do read on our everyone's environment work it sounds like we're sinking from the same page and he, he's observing that there's not a new dilemma in the sector, but very much still there, that we have on the one hand organisations with a strong environmental purpose wanting desperately to diversify their audiences. And then on the other flip side, we have um, other social issue focused organisations of various kinds wanting to bring environmental impact into their work with marginalised groups. How do we bridge that gap? Have you any any thoughts for what's worked for you guys and your organisations in collaborating across the divides of an artificially siloed sector? I mean, I, I could jump in here because when we first set up our steering group, we listed as many national and local and regional environmental organisations that we can think of and reached out to all of them with our ask around, we don't think you have any accessible information. Would you be up for working with us on some? And I've got to say, we didn't get a great response. Um, You know, I think in terms of asking an organisation to put some resource in, whether that's time or money, didn't go down really well. People were really applauding what we wanted to do, but didn't necessarily want to come in and help. Um, And even, you know, we we found a great video that had already been produced um, that just had a, I think it just had a, no, it it was a film and it had subtitles, but no voiceover. So if you can't read, that video is entirely inaccessible. So we asked if they had a version with a voiceover, which they didn't. So we asked whether we could collaborate and, you know, create that with them. and I just think at that point it just hit a block because it was a big, it was a big probably global climate organization. And I guess a small um, organization like ours asking to do a voiceover on their video maybe just blew their mind a bit, you know, in terms of how you get that signed off. Um, so we didn't find the doors as open as we would have liked, which is why we just cracked on and and went and developed some resources ourselves. So I I think in our case, I suppose this is what we found was that because in the environmental space where, you know, when we were starting out our environmental leadership program, for instance, um, there's, there was a very clear case of a lack of diversity in the sector. Uh, and because our focus is on, di- you know, harnessing young people from diverse backgrounds, um, in a sense that that helped uh, in terms of our core, you know our core mission is that and then building their leadership potential and employability uh, capabilities and so on that we we then did once we sort of started to engage with organizations particularly those in rural parts of the country who are working on environmental issues um where obviously there's a wider there's all sorts of issues around um how you know the, the the divisions in terms of rural urban um inter integration uh between different communities so we found that there was quite a lot of interest in working with us then the the tough bit is of course then build, linking those partnerships together into practical bids to funders uh and so on uh and, and as i say the 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 Abrat future was a really good initiative from that point of view while in the end wildlife trust was the lead uh in in that um and so it's a kind of you wouldn't normally on the face of anything and a charity um 
the focus on diversity and young people, you know, based in London, but working in different parts of the country um, may not be an, a, an, a likely partner of Wildlife Trust, but it worked brilliantly because they ha we have different things that we're bringing to the table. And likewise, we found that with um, other sectors, for instance, we set up a program in the early days, um, uh, which involved the refugee, um, uh, uh, one of the refugee uh, charities, um, which was about building the leadership skills of young people um, who have refugee status in this country. Uh, and so I think that sort of collaboration where people are bringing to the table their particular expertise is really important, but it, that does require the bigger organizations, particularly the funders, to encourage the collaboration. And it also requires um, those organizations, charities who are more established, as Karen was saying, you know, the big organizations to think about how they can connect and join up with smaller organizations without the resource and capacities and, and all sorts of challenges that your, your listeners will be familiar with, with smaller charities, um, how you can forge partnerships that are actually um, uh, genuine partnerships uh, and both sides can see the benefits of collaboration. I think that's where you get a really, you know, really big advantages and that's been, that's been our experience. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you. The time is flying by. So I'm going to combine a final few questions together and an answer whatever jumps out at you. Um, so we have uh, people wondering about building on opportunities. Karen, you saying this all began with an opportunity you didn't see coming and opportunities, how to harness them. Um, some suggestions on empowering diverse groups to engage in co-designing would be very welcome and whether some of your board members or directors needed convincing of the importance of this work whichever bit jumps out at you feel free to speak to that Aaron do you want to go first yeah um so in terms of how to engage diverse groups I think for us in terms of the, the groups of people that we work with, I think it was very much around kind of an offer. So our offer, we're really close to having our training resources ready. Um, and our offer to various different groups locally is going to be, this is free training. We can come and deliver it. We can do a train the trainer model. We're going to leave you with all the resources. They're also downloadable if you want to just download them and do it yourself. I think it's about not being precious. It's about understanding who the groups are that you're trying to engage with, which is kind of easy for us because people with learned just but you know, autistic people are our business. That's why we exist. We're not trying to engage with any anyone different. Um, and I think just showing that we understand kind of accessibility and inclusion. Um, that we respect people as citizens, that they are part of the conversation, they're part of the solution, um, is all the kind of positive messages um, that people really want to hear. And I think because we've co-produced all our materials, so we've had a diverse group actually work on them, we've tested them out with various different groups, um, hopefully they're, they're right and they... Um, kind of like resonate with people and they're pitched at the right level. And also they're just the start of the conversation because I guess the next bit of the conversation is, um, so what next? What what do you want to do now? Now you feel you've been invited to even be part of the conversation and be an active citizen around this. What, what's the next step? This is just the beginning. Thanks, Karen. Nishnara. Thank you. So our, our model is very much our organization's USP is about recruiting and training the next generation of leaders and also uh, supporting young people through mentoring, coaching in, in their employability goals. Uh, and so the, the starting point is making sure that, uh, at, you know, at our board, for instance, we've got representation of um, uprising alumni, including people who've been on the environmental leadership program, but also our core leadership program. And having a mix of the two so that you've got at the, the sort of uh, governance level, you've got a very strong 
uh, voice from from those who will have benefited from the program, as well as advisory networks uh, in different regions that we work in uh, from the alumni. The other thing is that we, you know, we we when we started out, we funders were pr- quite keen to support the alumni network so that we could harness them and support them on, on an ongoing basis. Obviously, as you get pressure, financial pressure those things slip away. So, you know, one of the things that we've still tried to do is maintain a strong connection with our alumni and find out where they're working. But it's not it's not been always possible. The journey is very important because what we're trying to do is make sure that we tackle powerlessness by ensuring that they are in lots of different institutions, including in the environmental space, that they are in those institutions working in there they are in the foundations, they are in the organizations like yours. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I use the term infiltration by by consent, um, because the point is that you want the next generation to be in those decision-making positions across institutions, not just in the board of the, our charity, th- though in the future, I'd like to see, you know, basically those of us who were involved with, you know, the, the old guard, if you like, sort of completely going and letting the the, the, the beneficiaries take over uh, and that's beginning to happen um but but also in terms of other institutions so that they their insights are used to help with the decision making so that influencing piece is very much a long-term thing and I'm already seeing that we are a beneficiary of that you know I now find myself you know talking to people who've been through the program who then uh, want to support the next generation of young people so it's kind of in, implicit so there's a there's a the, the approach is about making sure that that happens that's where we're trying to spread youth and talent youth young people's talent um, from diverse backgrounds by making sure that the institutions are hiring our young people thank you so much Shanara it's the space to do it but but that's very much the, the key around diversity and engagement thank you The one thing that struck me from our conversations today is how I think the phrase you used, Rishnari, was the multiplier effect, how small steps can become bigger and bigger steps and massive, powerful movements for change. So thank you so much. Um, I am hoping my colleague is popping into the chat right now, a little survey for those who could take a moment to give us some feedback. I'm sure you all know how important that is to continuous learning improvement and fundraising to make sure these kinds of events remain free. Other than that, I would just like to say an enormous thank you again to Roshanara Ali, Chair of Uprising, and Karen Parry, CEO of Inclusion North, as well as the Cloth Workers Company for funding this series of webinars. It's been an absolutely fantastic time together over this lunchtime. Do watch out for future webinars and Dan's going to post a link in the chat to the next one on impact measurement for trustees. I hope we will see you there. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.